So hello and good afternoon and welcome everybody to our webinar, follow up of patients undergoing CAR T cell therapy, new tools for immune monitoring. And I would like to introduce to you Professor Fese from the University Medical Center Hamburg-Eppendorf. Professor Fese is heading the research department for cell and gene therapy at the Department of Stem Cell Transplantation. And Professor Fese is an expert in the field, and he was, for instance, a two years the president of the German Society for Gene Therapy. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and we, and we are now very much looking forward to your presentation. So my topic is uh, monitoring of CD19 CAR T cells by digital PCR and flow cytometry. I have a conflict of interest statement, but you could read it probably later. I think all of you are quite familiar with this scheme. This is an autologous CAR T cell therapy scheme here. So patients are leukopharised and T cells are enriched, genetically modified to express the CAR and uh, expanded in vitro before the cells uh, could either be purified or given directly back to a patient who previously was lymphodepleted. And uh, even so, everybody kind of knows that this is a, a new treatment. So there is quite some development in, in CAR T cells. So the very first CAR T cells were already developed in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And this is a cartoon of a first generation CAR, so called. And this was done in the lab of Selig Escher mainly. And he also showed that these first generation cars they kind of worked in vitro, they were cytotoxic, but when they were tested in vivo, they did not work anymore. And um, this led to the concept of co-stimulation. So thank, thanks God they did not give up this principle and other labs joined in and incorporated co-stimulation signals so that at the end, the early 2010s and in 2011, the, this uh, first report came out. And this was based, of course, on, on those second generation cars. And we, as you probably know, we have third and even now fourth generation cars in the clinics. In hematologic diseases are mainly two uh, second and third generation cars. And also this, this breakthrough study in, in 2011, with three patients was done with a, a second generation car. And uh, these were uh, three patients, as I said, with uh, chronic uh, lymphatic leukemia. And uh, <coughs> led later on to the development, of course, of the larger studies of already yeah, more advanced drugs. And these are the three studies I show here for, for three of the CD19 cast teaser cell, axis cell and lisa cell. And as you see, even so the results are different, which could be explained by different patient populations. Still, the results are very good in a very uh, heavily pretreated patient population. So even so those patients had no any treatment alternative at that time anymore. We had a one year progression free survival of more than one third of the patients. So very nice data. And this is in B cell lymphoma, but the results were also very good in acute leukemias, which are of course mostly pediatric patients. And this led to the relatively fast approval of two of the drugs in the US in 2017, a lenti based drug teaser cell and the uh, retro-based drug axicel, both CD19 cars with the FMC63. Uh, and they were and at the same day in, in Europe, also licensed in August 2018. And we have now a couple of other um, drugs, car-based drugs, which are either in the pipeline or already have been approved, like um, Prexucel in US and Europe and, and the other ones. Of course, the CAR T cell therapy also is associated with side effects, so it's a very effective but also 
be a quite risky therapy. And the mo most prominent side effects are, of course, the cytokine release syndrome, which appears in about 90% of the patients with those two licensed CAR Ts and uh, neurotoxicity or ICANs, which in, appears in about half of the patients. And speaking about the side effects and about efficacy, one has to remind uh, himself that CARs are a living drug and these effects depend on in vivo expansion of the CD19 CAR T cells and on their exhaustion or loss later on. And this also has particularly been shown for axis cell in, in this uh, study in 2017 here is a clear correlation of the CAR T cell expansion rate with the uh, objective response rate in, in those about 100 patients. But at the same time, it was very interesting that these drugs were licensed, but there were no means to measure drug levels in vivo. I mean, the companies had those means, but uh, the researchers, the, the doctors did not have them. And so it, the patient was like a black box. Of course, you could measure B cell levels to see whether CARs are active or not, but you could not measure the, the CAR T cells. And we reasoned that this might be a, a perfect task for digital PCR. So for those of you who do not know the principle, it's like a, a normal quantitative PCR, but in contrast to a standard qPCR, the reaction is divided into, in this case, droplets and into, for instance, 20,000 individual reactions. And then the PCR is performed in all these small volumes. And for each of those droplets, there's an endpoint analysis where it's analyzed whether it's positive or negative. So either the PCR took place or not. So there, either there was in template or not. And then you get, if you have as here, a, a, a duplex reaction for a reference gene and your gene of interest, and you have double positive, single positives. So it looks a bit like a, a flow cytometry analysis and negatives. And um, and this is a, an absolute quantification. So you don't need any standard curve and you get a, an absolute number of, of signals in your sample. And so we developed a digital PCR first for axis cells. So it was first important to decipher the sequence because of course this is also not in the public domain or at least not easy to find. And then uh, we use this to, to develop this PCR. You see a very nice separation of the negative and positive signals. And this allowed us in, uh, to see in a dilution curve here that you can really go down to one single copy of, of the vector, which could still be readily uh, detected and quantified. And later on, we developed a second assay, which we call universal because it works with both AXI and teaser cell. And again, very nice separation. So the positives and the negatives are nicely separated and the same very nice correlation if you do a, a dilution curve and the reference copies and the car vector copies go down to, to one single copy. And um, we use this to prospectively monitor our patients. So this monitoring program was mainly developed by our clinicians together with Carolina Berger, shown here. So we have the, the uh, clinical assessment of response on the one hand and these prospective mon monitoring days on the other hand. And we use mostly blood samples, but also other body fluids and if available tumor tissue. And we biobank the plasma and PBMC for later analysis. So, so far we have analyzed more than 700 samples from 47 consecutive patients in this program. And I show you here one case of a 79 years old patient with an aggressive lymphoma. And here you see in this analysis that he had this very nice increase in the first week. So CAR T cells went up to more than one per microliter. And then in between day seven and 10, there was no increase anymore. And this was a bit worrying and particular worrying because this is his right leg. And you see all these bubbles here, which increased during this time. So 
of course, our clinicians were um, worried that this might be a very fast progression of disease. And um, then a couple of days later, on day 15, the cells were again in the blood, and this was how his leg looked like. This is kind of unbelievable. Within five days, the, all these um, lesions were necrotic, and the CAR, CAR T cells had done their jo job. And this is why they were lost here from the blood, because obviously they were all gone to the lymphomas and just uh, did what they were infused for. And this is the same patient now after about one year, still CAR T cells present, and this is his leg, and you see it um, looks uh, very good. So we did this, as I said, for all the patients, and we made an overview for the 21 first consecutive patients, which received AxiCell. And based on, on our data, we could divide the patients into two groups. First group were the weak expanders and the second group strong expanders. So we used the median AxiCell peak value to divide the groups. So these 10 were below median and these were above or equal to median. And this made a, a huge difference. If you look here, the weak expanders, all 10 weak expanders relapsed and eight of, of them died quite early after infusion of CAR T cells. In contrast, so strong expanders, we, we saw that only three of the 11 relapsed and two of them died. So if you look, this the same in, in a couple of Meyer curve, you see that the strong expanders had a 71% survival and uh, the weak expanders have this is progression free survival. There's no progression free survival within half a year. Okay, and uh, while we use this digital PCR, Milton he came up with uh, a CAR detection reagent, which could now be used also for flow cytometry, as shown here. The CD19 CAR T cells could now directly also addressed in, in the flow cytometer. And we also started to use this, this one. I show you just how we do this. Here's uh, the, the plots, um, the scatter plot, which we use to identify the cells. And then based on CD45 and CD3, we identify the T cells and use also live death markers. And based on this gating, you see here the CD4 CAR T cells. And this is about 41, in this case, 41% of the cells are CAR positive. And the same for CD8. And here it's even two times more, so about 86%. So this is a, the general gating strategy. And this was then used to analyze the CAR T cells also by flow cytometry. And we compared the data with the digital PCR data. And I start with the adult patients. And this is important because in, this is our patients. And as I said, we only did the digital PCR uh, prospectively. And we used here cells which were frozen and thawed for flow cytometry analysis. So it's not entirely the same because, of course, it's because of freezing thawing cycle. The so cells ha have suffered a bit, but still. You see a very nice correlation of the uh, data obtained by digital PCR and obtained by flow cytometry. You see the curves in it for these three patients. This is now two axi cell patients and one teaser cell patient. And you see the curves are generally very nicely going together. And we also did this with our pediatric patients. And here, this was done at the department for pediatric stem cell transplantation, uh, which is had by Ingo, headed by Ingo Müller, and Anne did the, Anne Kruchen did those analysis for flow cytometry. And here it's a bit different situation because they did this uh, flow cytometry prospectively. And in parallel, we did in a bl blinded fashion, the digital PCR. So we didn't know their results. And it was very nice to see that the curves were very similar for the patients here for the first two patients they treated in the pediatric department. You see the again the digital PCR data 
always a bit higher than the um, flow set of data, but the, the curves are very similar. And the most important part is here the later time points, as you might see, the curves when they went up for with digital PCR, they also went up with flow cytometry, the same here. And this is very important and, and may, might be very logical because these CAR T sets depend on, on the CAR expression to expand, but still, of course, it, it was to be proven that the data are very in line with each, with each other. Okay, but you can also use, of course, flow cytometry to typically characterize your cells, which in, in contrast to the digital PCR. And this is data kindly provided by Milton Eve with our very second patient, I think, where the, when, when this um, reagent was not yet available. So the, the data was in, uh, yeah, performed in Bergisch Gladbach or the analysis. And you see here, you can analyze CD4 CAR T cells for the sub compartments, naive cells, central memory, effector memory cells over time very nicely. And you can do the same with the CD8 CAR T sets. And moreover, you can also characterize, for instance, the exhaustion markers, like in this analysis here also performed in Bergisch Gladbach, where we, uh, the, these markers like PD1 or TIM3 were measured. So in summary, we have established a number of DPCR assays. I showed you the data for AxiCell and the universal assay, but we also have assays for other cars and including the, the Miltony ones. The limit of detection is one single copy, and this transfers into a sensitivity of about 0.01% for AxiCell, where usually more than one copy is in the cell, and 0.02 for teaser cell for 100 nanogram of genomic DNA. You can detect CAR T sets in different body fluids, but also in, two, in tumors. We have a, for axis, a very nice correlation of peak values with efficacy and side effects. I didn't show the side effects here. And uh, the CD19 CAR detection reagent is very sensitive, which allows you to, uh, allows a very straightforward quantification and also phenotypic analysis of CAR T sets. And, Finally, which is important, the digital PCR and the flow cytometry data are highly concordant. So in, in conclusion, both assays are excellently suited for in vivo monitoring of CAR T cells, and the monitoring is very useful to guide therapy. So I thank all my colleagues, in particular Carolina Berger in the lab, Anita and, and Silke, and uh, in the clinics, Fra Francis Ayuk, who is heading the CAR pot, uh, the CAR T program and Nicolaus Kröger, the head of our stem cell transplantation department, colleagues from the pediatric stem cell transplantation and from transfusion medicine, and the colleagues at Milton Biotech for the early FC data. Also, of course, the patients for supporting our studies and the funding agency, and you for your attention. Thank you. So, and now I would like to introduce to you our next speaker for today, who is Dr. Thomas Stübig from the University Hospital Schleswig-Holstein in the very north of Germany in Kiel. Dr. Stübig is physician by training with a clinical focus on stem cell transplantation and immune therapy, as well as diagnostics in hematology and on multiple myeloma. Dr. Stübig is working as a senior physician at the Department of Internal Medicine, Hematology and Oncology at the University Clinics. And we will now hear his presentation about the other side of CAR T cell research from bedside to bench side. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and we are very much looking forward now to your presentation. Thank you Hi. very much for the kind of introduction. <laughs> Thanks and the um, possibility to share some of our data concerning CAR T-cell research. And, um, this will be my agenda for today. So there is a question, why enriching CAR T-cell? Um, we heard that their cells are available in the blood, um, but just a question, why to enrich those cells? And then I want to touch a uh, soft spot on the um, analysis. Just some thoughts about uh, logistic and pre-analytic considerations. Of course, that will be um, the main part of the talk, 
focusing on the protocol, how to enrich CAR T cells using Milton's uh, kit and our experience with this technique. And that will also give you um, an outlook on what you can do uh, with the enriched cells. So you have seen this cartoon before by Boris Feser, and I will concentrate myself here on the um, second part um, of this uh, cartoon when the cells are re-infused into the patient and hopefully expand to kill the um, tumor cells. We heard that the expansion is quite a good indicator for the success of this therapy. But we also heard that patients showing low or nearly no expansion won't respond to this therapy. And therefore, those cells are highly interesting. And to look what's different in those cells compared to the cells of patients where they really proliferate. You be familiar that the majority of CAR T cells we use up to now are this blue 70% of CD19 CAR T cells. There is a variety of other CARs and mainly in clinical trials. And especially we in Germany are here look for the end of the summer where the BCMR CARs will be available for the clinical use. What you also see here on the right side of this um, slide are data from the EMT registry where you can see that there is nearly a constant use of uh, investigational CAR T cells where the commercially available CAR T cells are really making up for the majority of the products we use. Um, we already saw in a different kind these type of data. These are the two studies leading to the approval of both um, CAR T cell products here in Germany. So Axicaptogen with the CD9, uh, CD28 enhancer and a teaser gen with the 41BB construct. And if you look on the overall curves, this is what Boris Faeser also told you, is that they nearly um, produce equal response rates, um, producing long-time remission rates in 40% of those patients, which is remarkable if you compare this to the historical um, groups that we have. But to be honest, that 40% response means 60% are not responding to this treatment. Of course, this is a huge advancement, but still there is a lot of place to improve um, this therapy. So with this, I would like to go to why to enrich uh, CAR T cells. Um, we have seen these data before, and it shows the typical expansion of CAR T cells. And they vary from day seven after the infusion till day 14, most of the times having a peak expansion at day 11. But if you look on this curve, you see that there are patients really being more on day seven or even a little bit earlier, or there are patients really going to day 14 or a little bit later. And you can imagine that if you have to coordinate um, the expansion of the cells with a FOX, uh, core facility, this might really get you in trouble. So it is much more convenient if you have the sample and you can just enrich the CAR T cells um, in your own lab at the time you have the sample. The other thing that you want to keep in mind is uh, CAR T cells, of course, can make up to 40 or 50 percent of the lymphocytes. But um, if you look at the lower um, graph lymphocytes typically make up to 500 to 750 cells per microliter. So this number is much too low just to use whole blood, except you just want to look um, in the DD PCR um, if you uh, have the CAR constant um, uh, present or not. So I think I have convinced you that enriching CAR T cells is quite a good idea. But before we do this, I want to go to this soft parts um, or the soft skills, which is a little bit the uh, logistic and the pre-analytics. Um, at least in our institution, um, patients been treated in the outpatient department prior to the CAR T cell therapy. Then they go to the ward where they have been uh, treated with the lymphodepleting chemotherapy and uh, they receive the CAR T cells. They stay there until day 14 um, due to the uh, 
caveat of acute toxicity before they went discharged and then being again in the outpatient department. That means at least you have to coordinate those two sites with the third side, which is the lab where most of the work is happening. And it really involves a lot of communication um, with all people being involved. So I want to start a little bit um, with some considerations. This is maybe more interesting for those of you um, that plan to start um, uh, your CAR T cell analysis. So really you have to make sure you identify your um, patients. Maybe you want to get a pre-CAR sample or you want to get a pre-aphoresis sample. You should have a timetable where you know all the important dates like aphoresis when the patient is admitted to the ward. And of course, this is the time where you want to prepare all your regulatory um, requirements. I added this uh, blue box to the next following slides, which have some general consideration. They are, um, of course, more soft points, but they can make sometimes a big difference. So you want to pay attention on the stabilization of your sample. Maybe you want to use heparin, which is preferred by some people for flow cytometry as it keeps the antigens more stable. But if you're doing molecular analysis, you surely want to go to EDTA. Of course, transportation time can be an issue. Sometimes um, there is a transport service, but if you have a transport service that takes from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon, you might consider picking up the sample yourself as this will prolong your day. And temperature is also an issue. Now here, even in North Germany, the sun is shining and you really want to avoid that your blood sample uh, from the CAR-T patient is boiled for two or three hours in the sun. Of course, you want to think about uh, the amount of cells uh, you want to analyze, and this um, also is true for the amount of blood volume that you want from your patient. If you think about the time where CAR-T cells are infused, so the time that the patient is on the ward, most of the times this will be day to 14, you want to communicate your timetable um, for your samples with the ward, so that you make sure that you have all your precious sample at the right time point. You might want to check that your time point uh, you're interested in is not on a holiday or a weekend. And this might uh, sound like a joke, but it's really a uh, practical consideration. For example, if you, the patient receives uh, the CAR T cells on a Tuesday, that will mean that the day 11, the day of the T peak expansion will be a Saturday so if the day will be a Wednesday, the day uh, 11 will be on a Sunday. And this you might want to plan in advance. Um, and it's always good to have a clinical counterpart, especially if patients were admitted to the ICU due to acute toxicity. And you can really um, talk how you can get a sample even from the ICU. Of course, all the general consideration applies there as well. If you are going back to the post ward period, so most of the times it will be after day 14, you really want to know when your patient has an appointment at the outpatient department so that you can uh, get your sample. As Boris Faser showed you, it's always good to have for this later time point a strict time table when you want to um, have your samples. And it's also good to spend some thoughts about which material you want to analyze, if you really want to just take blood or you might want to analyze bone marrow too, or you want to use other um, fluids or tumor samples, like this you always have to plan in advance. But really keep in mind, CAR T cell treatment, at least in Germany, is not offered by every hospital. So the patients may come from really, really far away and if you miss um, a time point, there is little to no chance that you will get the sample again. In Schleswig-Holstein, for example, it is not rare that people travel two hours to our, um, our patient department. And if you forgot um, to get the blood, which takes five minutes, there is no way that you can convince a patient to come back in the next day, driving two hours, being um, getting a blood sample taken in five minutes and then drive back to us. Of course, you always want to double or maybe triple check that the appointment's still valid. There might be shifts in the timetable from the patient's side or from the physician's side. 
So with this general considerations, I want to go to the next step. This is how to enrich CAR T cells. And um, the enrichment kit for Milton is based on this um, CAR T detection reagent uh, Bobas Fisa uh, mentioned. It is this um, CD19 antigen, which binds to the CAR construct. And this CD19 antigen is fused to an IgG1, which is linked to biotin. And in the second step of labeling, you add an anti-biotin microbead, which binds to the biotin of the detection reagent, and then make it possible to enrich those cells via the standard magnetic enrichment process. Here is an overview over the enrichment procedure. So you have your starting material, you get rid of your red cells. In the supernage, there are your leukocytes with your CAR T cells. You start with the first part of your labeling process using the CAR T detection reagent. Then comes the second part of the labeling where you add the anti-biotin uh, microbeads and those microbeads will then bind to the already pre-labeled CAR T cells. And then you have your standard uh, magnetic separation step with the column and the strong magnets where you have the enrichment. Be aware that this is a positive uh, uh, enrichment that means the first flow out of um, your sample will be a negative fraction, so all non labeled cells. The capacity of um, this kit is roughly 100 milliliter. I will now go a little bit more into details. Um, you take 10 milliliters of blood, add the um, sediment and red cell removal buffers. You rotate the sample for five minutes, and then there comes a first um, slow but short um, centrifugation step, which is necessary to really uh, sediment down your red cells when, where you then have in the supernate your leukocytes with your CAR T cells. And there comes a second standard centrifugation step um, before you start labeling your CAR T cells with this CAR T detection reagent. This first period of the protocol really takes one hour. So at least this might be um, an argument why you don't want to start with this labeling on a late Friday afternoon. There are two things that I want to point out in this first um, part of the protocol. The first thing is the amount of blood, which are, is 10 milliliters, as the uh, sediment buffer and the uh, removing cocktail is referenced to this volume. Here, at least in our institution, the EDTA standard tubes are nine milliliters, and physicians are always in a hurry, so they don't really pay attention and have the patient to wait for the last one and a half or two milliliters that really slowly run um, into the tube. So in reality, you will get more seven or 7.5 milliliters from a big tube of EDTA. This is why you might want to consider to ask for two um, tubes of EDTA if you really want to enrich the cells. The second um, point is this first centrifugation step um, where our collaborators at Milton really um, encourage us not to increase the time or increase the speed so you should really check your centrifuge in advance if it's really just taking one minute to reach, um, if it's really short to reach the 50G and you don't want to um, extend the one main minute centrifugation time. If I go to the second part of the protocol, remember that your cells are already been labeled with a um, CAR detection reagent. Then there comes this second part where you uh, add the my anti Microbean, uh, microbeads, um, they bind to the pre-labeled CAR T cells and then you have your magnetic separation. Again, the first fraction will be a negative fraction. That means all your non-labeled cells or other leukocytes. And in the second fraction, if you put out the column and then have another um, go through, you will have your positive fraction or in this case, your uh, precious CAR T cells. Yeah, I want to stress one thing that is if you have a sample where you have high CAR T cell numbers, um, you may overload the column uh, at this first step. 
and you might have some uh, CAR T cells in your negative fraction. And I would recommend that you use those negative fraction again and just let it run over a second column really to be sure that you don't miss any of your precious CAR T cells. Um, the second step really takes about 30 to 45 minutes. I think 35 minutes is really a realistic um, time to plan for this second step. Here are some of our experiences with this uh, enriching technology. You see in the other patient, the original sample of a patient are on day 11. Um, you see the lymphocytes and the CAR T cells, and 46% of the um, T cells were CAR T cells. And after the um, enrichment protocol, you might see that there is a tenant's high site scatter for those lymphocytes. This is due to the washing with the different buffers. Also, those cells tend to form doublets. So be a little bit aware of this in your flow cytometry analysis, but you can really see that you have a nice enrichment of 97% of the um, cells being CAR T cells. We have used this kit now for at least five of our patients and uh, with a starting from a mean of 30% CAR T cells, We'll be able to enrich at a, uh, rates about um, 95% um, after this enrichment process. With this, I would like to go a little bit to the troubleshooting. The first troubleshooting is too little or too less cells. Uh, this is a patient sample having 0.1 CAR T cells at um, day 11, and the next day we have the sample for enriching those cells. And you see that in this original fraction, all like the patient sample, it was on day 12, 0.4%. We were able really to enrich those cells to 95% purity. This is not the problem, but however, there were far too little cells for downstream analysis. And this I would recommend you, if you know that you're gonna have a patient who shows um, non, uh, expansion, and these are really this, the patients we're interested in because these were probably the patients not responding well to CAR T treatment. You might um, want to ask um, at the station for additional um, samples so that you have enough material for downstream analysis. The second, in parentheses, uh, problem is if you have too many cells, these are already mentioned. This is a sample um, of a patient having six, nearly 60% CAR T cells. That was not that high, but the amount of lymphocyte was nearly uh, 3,500. Uh, it was no problem to enrich the CAR T cells, but in the negative fraction, we nearly found 15% um, of the CAR T cells. So this is why I would recommend if you know at the beginning of the enrichment process, this, this will be a sample where you expect high numbers of CAR T cells, just rerun the negative fraction at a second column so you won't miss those CAR T cells. How is um, the quality of the enriched cells? Most of the times we've been able to get a good cell number out of those um, enrichment process, and we have a good quality of DNA and also RNA, which is not shown here. But I show you here the DDPCR, which you now know by heart since Boris Fese has made you an expert on this topic. And you see here a DDPCR um, using um, DNA from uh, CAR T enriched cells. So, what you can else uh, you can do with um, the enriched cells, of course, you can do all cells, uh, types of RNA analyzing. Um, gene expression profiles or RNA sequencing, if you want to do. Of course, you can do all the um, DNA analysis. Um, we hope to have some methylene data um, now at the end of the summer and something we really, really interested in. Um, and we hope to get this started uh, in the next weeks are some functional assays. I can't tell you something about this, but maybe in a follow-up seminars, I can show you some data how those cells work then in an um, in vitro functional assay. And with this, I would like to, to conclude. Um, circulating CAR T cells show a huge range and therefore enriching is um, really essential for further analysis. I think enrichment is really a nice um, thing if you have no easy access to a flow sorting unit 24-7 a day. 
Uh, you should really plan, uh, plan carefully when is the most precious time point for you uh, to analyze your CAR T cells. Keep in mind that uh, different patient may expand at different time points. The max um, prep CD19 uh, CAR Milton microbeat kit um, is a quite a long name, but really works effectively and um, gives a high purity of CAR T cells. Overloading the columns can be a problem as well as too uh, few CAR T cells in the input, but um, I hope I showed you some uh, things you can do to avoid this. And the cell and the RNA and DNA from those enriched cells are really in a good quality um, for further analysis. I really thank um, the huge team which is helping uh, with this data from the clinical side all the physician, nurses, and uh, administration staff taking care of the patients and helping to um, get the samples. Of course, um, there are also many, many people uh, involved here in the lab with the CAR T-cell project. Um, a few people from the technical staff running the PCRs and Kirsten Schröder did most of the um, enrichment um, experiments. And also I want to thank our collaborators at Milton -E for sharing their knowledge and the kit with us. And I'd like to thank you um, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stübig, for this very nice presentation. And then I would like to close the webinar for today and hope to see you in one of our upcoming webinars again. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.